Do you remember Florida being pregnant in 1998? Yes. What signs did you observe? Her stomach was getting big and she was gaining weight. And did you do anything in preparation for the baby coming? Yes. We painted the room and we bought a crib for the baby. Did you also have a baby shower? <coughs> yes. Where was that held? I think it was at, at her house or my house one. I, did, I can't remember if it was at her house or my house. <coughs> Do you remember having one mm -hmm. That's a little know. bit of time ago? Yes. And how did you learn that <coughs> Gloria had a third child? She came home and she had the baby. And um, when she pulled up in the yard, I said, what is this? She said, my baby. And <coughs> she brought the baby in, put it in my lap. And I looked at the baby. And uh, She just was a beautiful baby. And Gloria was seeing so happy. And you said she, so it was a girl? Mm hmm. And what was the name of that child? Alexis Kelly Manigo. And did she have any nicknames growing up? Lexi, we would call her Lexi. And you now know that Lexi is the same child that we've been talking about this morning, Kamaya Mobley. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. How would you describe uh, Alexis's childhood? I think she was really beautiful. She was a well-mannered young lady, child, and a happy child. Mm -hmm. Would you say she was well cared for? Yes. Did you have the opportunity to babysit for her as well? Yes. Did she have regular medical treatment? Yes. And is she currently wearing braces? Yes. Have you had the ability to assist her with those? Yes. Uh, I helped paid uh, um, some back uh, bills on the dental and uh, we paid it up until January. Uh, is this 2018? <laughs> yeah, till 18, uh -huh, January 2018. Did Alexis ever go hungry? No. Did she always have a clean diaper? Yes. Did you notice any signs of abuse on Alexis? No. Were there any odd forms of punishment? No. Was she always enrolled in school? Yes. And in fact, did she graduate high school? Yes. Did she have a graduation party? Yes. Were you able to attend that? Yes. Did Alexis attend church with you? Yes. What church did you attend? Buckley United Methodist Church in Ruffin. And how long have you been a member of that church? Uh, I, I grew up there, and then I went away to New York, and I came back home, and I resumed <coughs> service here. So most of your life? Yes, most of my life. Did Alexis have any roles at church? Yes, she was a junior usher. What did that entail? Uh, stand at the door and see people and give them a fan if they need a fan. And sometimes she help with the collection when it's ushers, anniversary, she help take a collection. How would you describe Alexis's personality? To me, she has a good personality. Is she also a happy person? Yes. Uh, 
how would you describe Gloria and Alexis's relationship? A good relationship, mother and daughter. Yeah. It was a beautiful relationship. Uh, is Alexis respectful to you, Gloria? Yes. What about to you? Yes. Did you have any problems with her growing up? No. And how was your relationship with Alexis? It's good. She'll call him every now and then, and, and I'll call her. She's, and she stopped by the other night, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I, had, I wasn't feeling good, and she washed up the dishes for me. Uh, yeah. We have a good relationship. And what kind of things would you and Alexis do as she was growing up as a child? Sometimes we, I would play catch ball with her, and uh, and and, and uh, watch TV together. Did she spend a lot of time at your home? Yes. Tell me how your family spends the holidays. At Thanksgiving and Christmas, we all get together, have dinner. Spend it all together? Yes. Obviously, we are here today because Gloria has pled guilty to two counts of the information. How did you learn about the news of this crime? Her and Alexis came to the house and she told me that Alexis wasn't her child. And uh, and it was just like a shock. I was I was sitting there, I don't know, reading or doing something, and she said, "Ma, I want you to stop doing what you're doing. I got something to tell you." She said, "I did something real bad. Um, Alexis is not my child." And we sat there for a minute, and then they left. They're just like a, 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 a nightmare, a dream or something. And, uh, and they think I knew that it, she was arrested. Uh -huh. She and Alexis told you together? Yes. Uh -huh. And you said it was a shock to you? Yes, it was. Was that the person that you raised? Mm-hmm. Did you believe that that could occur from someone that you raised? No, I couldn't believe it. How has the last uh, 16 months since Gloria's been incarcerated changed your life? A whole lot. It seems like I've been sick or more. It seems like my health was going downhill. It changed a whole lot. And when you say you've been sick or a lot, um, have you been hospitalized since she's been incarcerated? Yes. How many times? About three times, three or four times. Mm -hmm. And previously, when you were hospitalized and Gloria was not incarcerated, what would she do for you? Come to the hospital, do my hair, help me get bathed. And uh, see the doctor, see what he's telling, telling about my health. Uh, so she would go to the hospital with you? Yeah. Did she also attend doctor's appointments with you? Sometimes. Mrs. Brown, are you mad at Gloria? No, I'm not mad at my daughter. I love her so much and I missed her. And I hope the judge and what he has 
she come back home with us and, and help me through my time. I need her and her father needs her because he's diagnosed with Parkinson and and I just want her to come home. And, and when she is, if she is ultimately released, you'll be there to support her? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Help her get back on her feet? Yes. Is there anything else that you think the court should know about your daughter before she imposes sentence? She's a good person. She's really but I think she's going to learn and ask God to forgive her for her mistakes. And Alexis love her and we love her and we want her to come home. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Ready, Ms. Brown? I just have a few questions, okay? Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Brown, do you agree that one job of a parent is to provide care, diapers, food, medicine like that for your children? Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Do you also agree that the job of a parent is to teach your child things? Yes. What kind of things do you think a parent should teach their child? Respect one another, each individual respect each other. Do you think it's important for a parent to set a good example for a child? Yes. And do you think it's important for a parent to not only tell a child to respect others, but to also show respect to others so the child learns from a parent's behavior and not just what they say? Yes. And you tried to teach that to Gloria Williams, the defendant, correct? Yes. Why did you take her to church regularly? Well, we brought up in the church, in the Sunday school, go to church, we respect your elders, we respect everybody, really. And uh, to learn about God. And, and when you used to spend time in church, did you learn do unto others as they would have them do unto you? You've heard that before? Yes. And did you try to teach that to Miss Williams, your daughter? Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> when you found out when uh, your daughter confessed to you that she had committed this crime, how long before she was arrested did that happen? Mm, I don't know what it was. The next day or the day after, I don't, I don't remember that. Okay. But it was within a very short Church, period? Yes. Do you think you would have told had you known earlier? In other words, if Alexis was one year old and your daughter came to you and confessed to you that she had stolen Alexis, what would you have done? I, I, I would have talked to her and tell her, let's take the baby, turn the baby in. What if Ms. Williams said, I don't want to do that, what would you have done? That I don't know. What I'd have did. I, I know but I'm I, asking I, this. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. I, all I would, I would try to tell her to turn the baby back in. Mm -hmm. Is that because that's the right thing to do? Yes. Did you have any clue for the 18 years that Kamaya Mobley, Alexis Manigo, was not your granddaughter? Mm -hmm. When Gloria Williams confessed to you, and I just want to make sure about that, she told you that she had done something real bad. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. And so, in your opinion, did she know that what she had done was wrong? Yes. Do you know how she was arrested? In other words, do you know if she turned herself in or whether the police had to go and arrest her? I think they came to our house. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions. Thank you. 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 Thank
you, Council. Anything further? Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. You may proceed with your next witness when you're ready to go. Very well. And if you'll please be seated. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Would you please state your full name for the record? My name is Wilbert Brown. And Mr. Brown, how old are you? 76. And where do you reside? Where do you live? Oh, South Carolina. Are you currently employed? Retired. From what? Transit Authority, number one. And I, I almost retired from Walmart. <laughs> and the Transit Authority, how long were you with them? Uh, 23 years. And was that in New York City? New York City. And are you currently married? Yes, ma'am. And is that to Mrs. Gloria Brown? Yes, ma'am. And I think she told us that, um, do you currently suffer from any health problems? Arthritis, Parkinson's. And when were you diagnosed with Parkinson's? Several years back. And are you taking medication for that currently? Yes, ma'am. And do you know Miss Gloria Williams? Yes, ma'am. How do you know Mrs. Williams? It's my daughter. How would you describe Mrs. Williams? Lovely child. Lovely child. Was she respectful? Yes, ma'am. Give you guys any problems while she's growing up? You know, ma'am. <coughs> Do you recall when Gloria was married to Mr. Bolden. Mr. Who? Bolden. Yes, ma'am. And at that time, did you guys have to help her out with the boys? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> well, because, because they come spend time with us. So we, when, we was at, when they come see us, we take care of them. How were, uh, and that's Andre and Antoine, correct? Yes, ma'am. And how were they growing up? Average kid, you know. Joyful, a little bad, so I'm just talking to you or something. But as I say, young kids having fun. Can I have you pull that mic up closer to you? Would you say they had a good childhood? Yes, they had a good childhood. Were you pretty close with them? Mm -hmm. Well, not as close as should have been because they used to stay in a different part of town. But you got to see them often? Quite often. Not enough in your mind, though? <laughs> no. Do you recall a time when uh, Gloria was dating a guy named Charles Manigo? Yes, I remember. <laughs> what can you tell us about that relationship? Bad, 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 bad mix up there. <laughs> Why is that? Because he was abusive to her. Yeah. Was that something you heard or did you actually observe some markings on your daughter's body? I, I had observed some of it, but I tried not to get uh, really upset about it. What did you observe on uh, any markings on your daughter's body? Well, the bruise, bruise marks. When he pulled a socket out of the arm. It was a pretty tumultuous relationship then? <laughs> yes, ma'am. And do you remember Gloria being pregnant in 1998, Mrs. Williams? Oh, yes. At some point 
she brought Alexis with me to go home? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about Alexis. Well, Alexis was a real nice, very lovely little baby. <laughs> and did you get to spend a lot of time with her? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. How so? Mm -hmm. Quite often. Quite often? <laughs> Was she a respectful child? Yes, she was. Healthy child? Help, help me. <laughs> Did she ever want for anything? <coughs> no, not really. Why is that? Because we saw to it that she got what she wanted. <laughs> Did she remain enrolled in school? <laughs> yes. And did she attend church with you guys? Excuse me? Did she attend church with you guys? With the mother more often than me, because I didn't go as often as the wife did. You have house to yourself on Sunday? <laughs> yes. yes. <clears throat> what was your relationship with Alexis? We had a very loving relationship. And what did she call you? Daddy. <laughs> Why is that? Because <laughs> that's what she loved to call me. <laughs> That behavior, kidnapping a child, is that out of character for your daughter? It is, very out of character. <laughs> And have you remained in touch with uh, Alexis since Gloria's incarceration? Yes, ma'am. How does she seem to be doing? Well, I use a cell phone or we go by the house, the house and see her. She seemed to be doing okay? She's doing fine. How has your life changed over the last 16 months during your daughter's incarceration? My life didn't change that much. I just, it was hard to understand why she did it. But as far as my life changing, I, I didn't change any of that. Do you still get to speak to her regularly? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma you just don't get to see her regularly. Right. And what would you 
like the court to know about Mrs. Williams, your mm -hmm. daughter, before she imposes a sentence? Well, like I said, he said you, you, you do the crime, you got to do the time. You know, I just said, hope, hope it's not as bad as it, as it might be, but whatever it is, you have to accept it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Reverend Sherry White. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madam Clerk, we'll swear you in and then if you'll please be seated. Sheree Yvette Bass White. And can you spell that for the court reporter? S H E R I Y V E T T E hyphen B A S E White W H I T E. And Ms. White, are there any titles that you go by? Mom, Pastor, Rev. And where do you reside? I reside in Ravenel, South Carolina. And what type of education do you have? I have a Master's in Divinity from Hood Theological Seminary, Salisbury, North Carolina. And have you ever served in the military? I have. Which branch? U.S. Army. And how are you discharged? Honorable discharge. Are you currently employed? I am currently employed. And where is that? I have a employment with U.S. Securities, which is a night job that I have. But I'm full-time employed as the pastor of the Ruffin Parish, which includes Hickory Hill United Methodist Church and Buckhead United Methodist Churches. And how long have you been over the Buckhead Church? I have been with Buckhead United Methodist Church since June 26 of 2013. So I am in my fifth year. And what are your duties as a reverend there? Everything you can think of. <laughs> um, I am there as administrative, I'm there as counselor, I'm there as the projecting of the word, I'm there as pastoral care where I'm visiting the sick, I'm pretty much everything that they would need as far as guidance or direction. And tell us about your church. Oh, wow. Like I said, I pastor two. Um, I have Hickory Hill, which is in Smoke, South Carolina, approximately seven miles away from Ruffin. Um, approximately 45 members that attend. Um, about 65 membership on the roll. Hickory Hill works very well with Buckhead, which is the church in question in Ruffin, South Carolina with a membership of approximately 65 individuals, approximately 80 on roll. Um, Buckhead is in the town of Ruffin, right in front of Ruffin High School, which has closed. Um, both churches are wonderful churches to serve. Um, they get along well. If something happens to one, all of them come together. And we help out each other, no matter what. And you've touched on it, but tell us a little bit more about your parishioners at Buckhead. Buckhead is a family church. I think out of all of the members there, there are only two individuals that were not born and raised in the Walterboro or Ruffin area. I believe one of them might be Brother Wilbur Brown, um, and the other one may be Sister Thelma Ackerman. But other than that, everybody is family, and they, they go to school together, they rear their children together, and when someone dies, they mourn together. When there's a birth, they are excited together. You know, it's, you can never go there and say, I need help, and there wouldn't be someone there to help you out. I learned that firsthand. The first Sunday I preached, I preached at Hickory Hill, 
which is in Smokes. I went home. <laughs> I found out the next Sunday that I was supposed to go to Miss Vivian's house for dinner because that's what the pastors always did. And I've been there every Sunday that I can since. So it's a community of love. <coughs> and do you know Gloria Brown Williams? I do. How do you know Mrs. Williams? I'm her pastor. I'm her friend. And at which church is that? Buckhead. What do you call Mrs. Williams? Quita. Is that what most people at the church call her? Mostly. That way we don't get confused between Miss Glow and Quita. <laughs> And you stated you know Mrs. Williams from church. Is she a member at the church? She is. And was she an active member? Very active. How so? When I arrived at the church, um, we needed a youth coordinator. And we didn't know exactly what we were going to do because the youth coordinator prior had quit. Um, and I talked to her about it. I was like, you know, do you think you could do this? And she accepted the challenge of being the youth coordinator. She also accepted the challenge of being on Pastor Parish Relationship Committee, which we call PPRC. Um, and that's a handful by itself. She's a United Methodist woman, so she works with mission in the community as well as abroad. Um, she's an avid member. You know, she's not a just on the road. She is a in involved every Sunday that the doors are open every first and third Sunday she's there she has organized some things for the community even and the selection of a youth and children's coordinator tell the court about that is there a nomination process there is um, we have a nomination committee um, at the church matter of fact at all church at both churches the nomination committee is in prayer to find someone that would have the temperament, the attitude, the love to care for children elementary school age on well through high school. Um, we labeled it age appropriate ministry because we don't have a lot of children. We don't have a lot of youth. I think when I got there, there were only two, well, three youth because I brought my daughter. So there were you know, only that age group, but we still have a lot of children. Um, we try to find someone that will not only love the children, will take care of the children, protect them, but also someone that is <coughs> going to be there when the children need somebody to talk to. And with prayer, we came up with Gloria. And so it was my job to go ask her if she would be interested because this is not a small task. You're dealing with teenagers. You're dealing with young children. And sometimes they can be very rambunctious. But she said she was willing to try. And did that require a statewide background check? It did. Matter of fact, all of our positions that have to deal with the elderly or the children or those who are not able to speak or care for themselves require a background check as well as an interview by the members of the council and the church. And did she go through that background check? And she did. And the interview process? She did. What is a certified volunteer? Same thing. Certified volunteer means that you have already gone through the background checks, you have been approved, um, you have gone through council as well as charge conference. And charge conference is the conference that we have within the body of the church to designate our leaders for the next coming year, as well as what programs we have already done and programs we're going to be doing in the future tense. And so being deemed a certified volunteer as the Youth and Children's Coordinator, um, Mrs. Williams was able to work with youth and vulnerable adults? Yes. And how long did she serve as your youth coordinator? Until I had to pick someone else. Um, she, became my, she became my official youth coordinator in January of 2014. Um, and I had to get an interim in February of 2017. Was that due to her incarceration? It was. 
And as a youth coordinator in that position, did Mrs. Williams have to take co-ed day trips and overnight trips with female parishioners? Yes. Were there any ever complaints or accusations made during that three-year term? Not that came to me, no. And what is Harumbi? Harumbi is a, it's like a youth summit. It's where the children can come together and they learn about a specific topic. And in learning about that topic, it's related to them, what's going on in their lives. Um, it's where they can kind of let down their hair and be kids. They can talk to adults from around the state. Get, they have their own speakers. Sometimes they have music involved. They have dance involved. But it's a way for them to communicate and find out things with each other outside of, you know, mom and dad's prying eyes. They can talk to each other and say, you know, okay, I'm not doing this by myself. You also have problems in Europe and the upstate, or, you know, how can we form a friendship and work together to solve problems? Is that a religious-based summit? It is. And did Mrs. Williams attend one of those summits with you? If I'm not mistaken, I believe she attended two. That I was that while I was the pastor, and was she invited back after the, uh, oh, the attendance? Oh yes, matter of fact, um, they had such a good time when they took their group picture. I think that was the year they had over 120 students, and they actually took a group picture. Um, they were at Claflin University, and she was in the picture. And they were, they, they said she had more energy than the kids had because they, the kids were a little shy about dancing in the church because, of course, we teach them dancing in the church is not good. But um, they were trying to get them to understand that it was a safe space where they could be themselves. So they asked her if she would come back the next year, and I gladly signed the paperwork. And you mentioned the pastor parishioner relations committee. What is that? PPRC is a committee in the United Methodist Church that I think everyone wants to be on, but nobody wants to be on. It's the committee that is in charge of any individual who is a paid employee of the church. So myself, I'm a paid, I'm a paid employee. Our sexton, our custodian, um, paid employee, our organist, our drummer. They set the contracts, they set the guidelines as to what they need us to do. They evaluate our performance, especially the pastor, because my evaluation does not stay in-house. My evaluation goes to the district and then goes to the conference. And with that evaluation, depending on if I have done my job in a way that they see fit, then I may be asked to come back. Um, if I have not and they think they need a new pastor, then I'll be asked to leave at the end of the year. And Mrs. Williams served on that pastor parishion uh, relations committee? She did. Was she also a Christmas program director for the church? She was. She was. What did that entail? We wanted to do something to try to draw attention to the fact that we didn't have a lot of youth. Matter of fact, when she was on PPRC, she represented the youth portion of the church because each person represents a section. So if the children had a question or if they wanted something or they had an idea, of course, it would come through her and come to me. We had a Christmas um, celebration and they wanted it to be different. So we decided to do drama. We decided to put up a Christmas tree. We decided to do drama. We decided to put up a Christmas tree and a Christmas tree. And we just couldn't figure out where to put both trees. But um, we wound up with the tree in the sanctuary. And she came up with the idea of instead of the adults decorating the tree, that when we actually come in and we do what we call um, hanging of the greens, which is the first Sunday in December, uh, we would come in and let the children participate. So that year, the children turned on the lights. They brought down the poinsettias. They helped hang the wreaths. And at the end of service, they hang all the decorations on the Christmas tree or the Christmas tree in the sanctuary. And throughout the month, there would be presents under the tree because we would get together and 
put things under the tree for the children so that when we had our pre-Easter, excuse me, pre-Christmas program, uh, the night before Christmas, which was put on by someone else, they would actually have gifts. They wouldn't leave empty-handed. And that was um, an idea of Mrs. Williams's? It was, a, a, it, was her, it was something that she helped carry out, but it was a joint effort between worship and the youth department. And what is UN Women? United Methodist Women. Um, the United Methodist Women of the South Carolina Annual Conference are a group of women that have pledged to be about mission. Every church is allowed to have a United Methodist Woman in the South Carolina Conference. Uh, you have clusters. Some of them have seven members. Some of them can have up to over 200 members in a church. Of the South Carolina Annual Conference are a group of women that have pledged to be about mission. Every church is allowed to have a United Methodist Woman in the South Carolina Conference. Uh, you have clusters, some of them have seven members, some of them can have up to over 200 members in a church. But what these women do is they do mission work, whether it be packing lunches for those that are sick, or rather like what we do, we give out fruit baskets, and we've been giving them out not just at Christmas, but sometimes throughout the year. We help with the soup ministry in the church for those that are elderly, not just our members, but in the Walterboro community, the St. George community. Um, we take up money and we send our money to the different homes that we have because we have different missions in the state as well as outside of the state. The money that is raised by United Methodist Women as a whole can touch the lives of people from South Carolina, to Africa, to Honduras, to Jamaica, it's worldwide. So it's not just something we do in-house, but we do plan activities in-house so that we can fund those missions abroad. And, and Mrs. Williams, was she a member of that organization? She well? was an active member. She was, if I'm not mistaken, I believe she was communications for that group because they gave me the job <laughs> after it was over. And what does that job entail? Oh, wow. If we are planning something, if we are doing something at the church and it has to do with raising money, um, the job was to make sure we contacted the newspaper, contact the advocate, which is the South Carolina newspaper for the United Methodist Church, um, contact the, the groups that we wanted to come in, um, send out invitations, send out flyers. In other words, make sure that the word got out so that we could have a good showing and have a good participation group so that other churches could come and help us raise money so that we could do mission abroad. That sounds like another full-time job. It is. And what is Victory House? Victory House is the Veterans Victory House in Walterboro. It is a state-owned establishment for our veterans. Um, if you are a veteran and there's room available, you're able to stay at the Victory House. And who is Mr. Green? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Willie C. Green. <laughs> uh, I have to make sure because I went to the hospital once looking for Mr. Willie Green. And it was the wrong Willie. Um, Mr. Willie C. Green is a member of Buckhead United Methodist Church. I met him at Victory House. And in communing with him and talking with him and sometimes even arguing with him because he wouldn't take his medicine. He said he wanted to come back to church. He wanted to be able to visit Buckhead. He realized he was getting older and some people that were coming to visit him were telling him about different people who had passed away. So he wanted to be able to come back. And through the help of Sister Williams, Gloria, she was able to get it to where he could come back believe he was with us twice while she, while she was employed at the Victory House. And honestly, the first time he came back, I remember he was so happy to be there. And he told everyone that he was glad that he could come and be at church because he had to have a chaperone. You know, you can't just leave the Victory House. You have to be signed out by someone that was 
and you know that was going to be able to take care of him. So we we fostered him coming, and he was able to talk to Miss Seabrook, who he hadn't seen in a very long time. And within a few a few months, Miss Seabrook passed away, and I remember him saying that he was glad he was able to talk to her that time because if he hadn't come back. He wouldn't have been able to tell her the things that he needed to. What those things were, I don't know. But I know it was something that was a load off of his shoulders. And that was through the assistance of Mrs. Williams? It was. And what is uh, the bikes and barbecue events? We still have it. Um, we needed a fundraiser for our youth. They wanted so many different things. They wanted to go to Harumbi, they wanted to go to Sapahatchee, they wanted to have a float for the MLK Day Parade. They wanted and needed scholarships for when they go to college. They had aspirations and we did not have a budget. We didn't have the money. We were busy paying bills. And I remember that I had a few bikers that were members of both churches <laughs> And a friend of mine went to a blessing of the bikes at a church, and they raised money. So I brought it back, and I said, do you think we could do this? Well, Gloria took that and ran with it. And we had the first bikes and barbecue at Buckhead United Methodist Church. And she helped to coordinate the food. She helped to coordinate the bikers. She helped coordinate the communication that went out. Um, I think for eight months straight, she lived and breathed bikes and barbecue and where were we gonna get everything. And it was a chance to bring the two churches together with the youth and to the point where I believe she even ran into our bishop and invited him and gave him a flyer to come to bikes and barbecue. And of course he wanted to go, but his wife wouldn't let him get on a bike, <laughs> you know. But it was a success. We, that first year, set the mark. And we, it rained because we picked the day before Easter Sunday. But the bikers were outside with the ladies helping them to put flowers on the cross, which is a tradition that they do. Um, they were outside helping us put things together. We had the blessing and we went on the ride. And honestly, we raised a good bit of money for the youth something that would not have happened had we not put forth that much effort and had not she had the energy to do a whole lot of talking. And she being Mrs. Williams? Yes. And did Mrs. Williams assist you in some way in, in obtaining information regarding your possible VA benefits? Yes. What was that? For years I've been fighting to get disability with the VA or just acknowledged that I'm a veteran. And one day I was talking to Queter about it, and she said, um, you know, all veterans have a doctor. I said, I don't have one. All veterans have a doctor at the VA. I don't have one. And she said, you know what, give me your information. So I did. And she came back and she said, here's your doctor. Here's the plan that you're on. Here's where you need to go have your physical. And if you have your physical, you will be in with no problem. I scheduled a physical the next day. And when I got my VA card, I came running and showing her my VA card with the most ugliest picture on it. <laughs> but I was happy that I had it because now that means I can go to the VA and be seen at least once a year for a physical and I can get my medication, which actually helps me out. And did that ultimately turn into some type of veteran's fair at the church? It did. Um, I was able to connect with a gentleman by the name of Larry Evans, who works in Columbia. <clears throat> and we were talking with him. I found out that there are a lot of other people, like me, who are not getting the information that they need so that they can get their veteran benefits. Or they've been fighting for a long time to get them, and nobody's there to help them. So we decided that we would put on a veterans fair, a veteran information fair, and we did it at Buckhead. And Gloria was instrumental because with her being at the Victory House, she was able to help us get the word out. 
you know, family members would come in, she'd tell them about it. We made sure that we had flyers, we had yard signs. And that day, we were able to sign up about 30 individuals um, to come in the door and receive the training so that they understood the policies, they understood how to read the healthcare pamphlet, because that could be a very thick pamphlet to read. They understood that they could get insurance. Um, if they couldn't get health, life insurance, they could get death and burial insurance. And that was something I didn't know about. And now when people say, well, you know, this person is sick or that person is sick, I'm able to tell them that there is such a thing as death and burial insurance that they can actually receive. So with her help, a lot of people in the Ruffin area, a lot of people in the Walterboro area were able to get at least their foot in the door. I'm not sure where they've gone as far as their quest, but I know with mine, I'm still, I'm still foraging ahead. And that was with the assistance of Mrs. Ford? It is. Did you know Mrs. Williams to use any illicit drugs? No. Did you know Mrs. Williams to abuse alcohol? No. And did you have the opportunity to meet Alexis Manico? I did. And how old was she when you first got to the church, do you recall? Mine was 13. I'm thinking she was either 14 or 15. And would you, how would you describe Alexis' personality? Firecracker. Um, she lights up a room. Her smile is contagious, um, respectful, a joy to be around, and no matter what, she's going to try to make you laugh. And did you get to spend a lot of time around her? I did. Did you ever observe any signs of abuse? No. Any odd form of punishment? No. And did you know her always to be enrolled in school? Always. Did you know her to ever want for anything? No. And was she considered the, the baby at the church? Alexis was everybody's baby. Um, everybody had a hand in making sure that Alexis got whatever Alexis wanted. Um, she was, and still is, the love of Buckhead. Uh, we, we miss her dearly. But we understand that with her growing up, things are gonna change. Matter of fact, I think when Alexis graduated high school, we made sure that she received a scholarship from the same group that we've been trying to raise money for, that her mom had a hand in raising money for, so that she could actually go on to college if that was her choice. And do you have a daughter? I do. And what is her name? Armani. And were she and Alexis friends? They were. Um, they hit it off well together. Did Armani spend time over at the Williams' residence? All the time. And did you have any problems with allowing her to stay over there? No. Um, I just get a phone call from, from Quita, or I get a phone call from Armani on Quita's phone saying, I'm, I'm, you know where I am, I'm at Mom's. Okay, you're at Mom's, so fine. I'll pick you up on the way home. Okay, do I have to come home? Yes, you have to come home. So it, it, it was like a sisterhood. They had fun together. They went walking. Um, sometimes now I'll be driving through Walterboro and Amani will be like, Mom, that's the park we went to. Or, you know, that's the, that's the restaurant we ate at. And I'm like, okay. You know, different things they did together. No problem. And so Armani and Mrs. Williams were also very close? Very close. And how old is Armani? Now, Armani is 18. And you trusted Mrs. Williams with your daughter? Absolutely. And you, would you still trust Mrs. Williams with your daughter? Absolutely. How would you describe Gloria's personality? Sunshine. She'd come in. If she was having a bad day, you really didn't know it. Um, she'd always have a smile on her face. 
If something was going wrong, you really wouldn't know it. She'd try her best to put the best foot forward. You know, always have a kind, loving, warm heart, you know, when, when dealing with people. And you know, ultimately, Mrs. Williams be, was a member of your church, um, but did that membership and, and through that, as a parishioner, did that grow into an actual friendship? Yes. And you had a personal relationship with Mrs. Williams outside of the church? Yes. Tell the court about that. When I first got to the church, um, I think both of us were in the same space of time when you think about our lives. She was getting ready to go back to school, I think, to get her bachelor's. Um, and I was finishing up my master's. And a lot of times, you know, I'd be pulling my hair out. I'd, I'd, I'd look like I was tired, I guess. And she'd stick her head in and be like, all right, now, Pastor, I need you to smile. And I'm, I'm like, I don't feel like smiling. And we, we talk. And we talk about things that pertain to the church. And then we talked about things that did not. Um, she called me to check on me. I called to check on her. Um, if I didn't see her during the week at a meeting or something, I'd call just to make sure she was OK. Um, called to make sure school was OK, you know. It was, it was a situation where if a pastor needed a friend, she was there. And did you know Mrs. Williams' parents? Were uh, I did. How do you know that? They're my members. How did you view Gloria's relationship with her parents? I thought it was great. It was awesome. Um, a lot of times I'd, I'd say, you know, I just want the strength to be able to do that. Because if, if Miss Gloria went to the hospital, if Miss Glow went to the hospital, Quita orchestrated care who was going to sit with her, who was going to be bringing food, who was going to monitor her at night, but then she also made sure that there was somebody taking care of her father. Because he may get on the road and decide he wants to drive there, or he may stay home. And she made sure that all of that worked in sync. And it seemed like it was smooth sailing always. Oh, that was cute. Um, she calls him Daddy. That's the only name I know her to call him. I've never heard her call him Granddad or anything. She'll come in, hey, Daddy. Sometimes, you know, I still I miss hearing it when the door opens. Um, and she calls her Granny. If if Daddy needs something or Granny needs something, she's she's there. Um, she sat with Wilbur when Glover's in the hospital, and vice versa. You know. It's a loving relationship. You know, you, you couldn't ask for anything more. She's loving with her, with her aunts. She's loving with her cousins and her friends. That's just how it is. Does it seem like a pretty tight-knit family? Yeah, to be honest, it is. I was at the hospital in Orangeburg visiting with a parishioner. And um, the lady was in ICU. And I got a phone call. Of course, I ignored it because I'm in ICU. The phone kept ringing and kept ringing. And when I finally answered it, it was her cousin asking me where was I, what was I doing, and if I was watching TV. I told them I was at ICU in Columbia. What are you talking about? What's going on? And she said, step out and look at the TV. She said, you know, Quita just got arrested. And I was like, what for? They kidnapped me. Who? <laughs> Alexis. And I looked at the TV. I went back in the patient's room. Stayed there for about 10 minutes. Said a prayer for the family. Walked out the hospital. My, my mom and I got in the car, and I immediately called my district superintendent. And while driving down the interstate at a speed that I will not tell anybody, 
I was able to get to Ashley Ridge, which is in Somerville, and get back to Walterboro before her arraignment because I wanted to make sure I was there because I felt somebody needed to be there for Alexis. What did you think about the news? I, I'm still baffled by it. Um, trying, you know, you try to wrap your head around things. Um, at first I said, no, it's not true. They got the wrong person. Um, then when stories un unravel and you see things on the news, I said, well, I'm not sure where she was in that time in her life because I did not know her then. But the person that I know now, that's not that person. And who is the person that you know now? The person I know now, the person I still write and contact, is a loving, caring, God-fearing woman. You know, she, she's an encouragement because when all of this happened, <coughs> where other people would get mad and get angry, she told her mom to ask the church if they would buy her two Bibles. And I'm sitting there saying, that's all she wants? With two Bibles and some snacks. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I told her mom, don't worry about it. I buy the Bibles. Because if you're going to remember who God is, and you're trying to get closer to God, even closer than you already are, then I know you're in a good place. I'm sorry this happened, but at least I know you're still in a good place. And to me, as a pastor, that's a wonderful thing to hear when someone says they want to get closer to God, even in the midst of going through a terrible situation. Because other people would usually run away. Other people would go the other direction. But um, she wrote and said that she was, she was reading her Bibles and she was studying and she was understanding a little bit more about what those sermons meant on Sunday morning. And that was a great relief because I understood now that she's getting stronger. You know, the Bible tells us that when we're weakest, he's stronger. And I'm thankful that she is getting stronger. And how has Mrs. Williams' incarceration over the last 16 months affected you? I've lost a friend. Not, no. I have not lost a friend because I know where she is. <laughs> But I don't have that ray of sunshine like I used to. You know, it's, you, you have to be there in order to understand the way the church is configured. Um, I don't close my door when I come in. My door stays open to my office. If the office door is closed, I'm in council. They know that. So every morning, Sunday morning, when people are coming in, they have the opportunity to stick their head in and say, hi, pastor, or can I have a minute, or ask a question. And I still wait for the door to open and her to come through. Curly hair, all smiles, saying, okay, what are we going to do today? I've been trying to get her on the choir, but she says she can't sing. <laughs> so I know I, I won't be able to do that. But I really miss her. And have you noticed that any uh, effect that it's had on your daughter? Yes. And what is that? When it first happened, the money was very bad. Because she said that y'all arrested the wrong person. And I had to explain to her that we had to first find out what was going on. And then she got worried about Alexis because she didn't know where Alexis was or what was happening. And then she was like, okay, Ma, what's Ma, you know, what's Ma going to do? You know, how are they going to take care of Ma? You know, you know, Ma needs her medicine. Ma needs this. Ma needs that. And I kept telling her, it's going to be okay. And when we got that first letter with her address, I think a mommy wrote her a letter or something. And... Um, Amani was like, okay, we gotta, we gotta go down there, we gotta see her. And I told her, I said, as soon as we can, we will, but let's get through this. And that way we can actually spend time with her. So she's, 
She's okay, but she misses her friend. She misses being able to go over to their house and eat dinner. She misses being able to talk to Gloria about things. So apparently she was able to talk to Gloria about things she couldn't talk to me about, which is a wonderful thing. I encourage it. Just long, you know, I knew that if it was something that was detrimental, she would come and tell me. But she misses that. She misses the being able to, to be there. Um, my members know me, I'm a bucket of water. I've only been with them five years. Some people would say, okay, that's a short period of time. But I'm a hands-on pastor. And I know from being in their homes, being in their hospital rooms, I know the effect that this is happening, this is having on our church. To the point where I'm pretty sure I have about two groups right now that are praying and praying and praying. We understand, yes, something wrong happened. We understand, we don't know why, but we understand. But we also understand that her mom and her dad They're doing the best they can. Her aunts are doing the best they can. The membership is doing the best they can. But they really pray and wish and hope that she's able to not receive the maximum. That way she can come back and be viable in the church. That way she can come back and still be able to pick up her job or by then, maybe they have a new ministry. That way she can come back and spend time with her parents. That way she can come back and be a part of Ruffin, be a part of the Walterboro community. Because they really miss her. They really, really miss her. She was a large part before I even got there. So I stepped into greatness, and they miss that. They miss that so much. They really do. But I would like to testify that Alexis, I'm going to use Kamaya, that's all right. That's fine. That, uh, Kamaya was everyone's baby in the church. She know? was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Except for her biological mother, biological father, biological grandparents, and the people that were rightfully supposed to be her caregivers, correct? No. The way that you no, but the way that you're posing that question, the way that I'm understanding it, let me make sure I'm understanding okay. correctly, Go ahead. because you're saying that she was not the grandchild, the child of the biological parent. Am I correct? Correct, because she was stolen and they didn't know where she was. Okay. Technically, she is still and will always be their grandchild, their child, but she was not maybe in the, in the possession of. You got to understand, if I give birth to a child and I give that child up for adoption, that is still technically a child that I gave birth to. That's still technically my child. I may not have that child in my possession. That's what I'm understanding. Am no. I understanding incorrectly? No, you saw Shannara Mobley's testimony, did you not? Were you sitting in the courtroom for that? I saw her, I listened to her testimony. It looked like but, she gave up her child for adoption? No, she didn't. Okay. okay. But so what I'm saying I, is, I'm not, I don't know if I, the, the, the point of the matter, I mean, the way he asked the okay, question. Let's just stop for a minute. I am very sensitive and understanding that this is a highly emotional thing for everyone. Right. But, but listen, but what we're going to do is we're going to follow the law, we're going to proceed in a methodical manner because I am busy taking all of this information listening intently and processing all of this, so it will help me if I can have the question finished, a very short pause, 
and then the answer, I'm listening very carefully to what you're saying, what all the witnesses, all the attorneys are saying. But I cannot understand everything that's being said if things are being said on top of one another. This happens often in trial. It's very common. It's something that we handle. It's not a problem. But let's just have a very brief pause after the end of the question, and then a very brief pause after the end of the answer. And we have as much time as we need, and I am here to listen. Um, so Reverend White, you would agree that in 2014, the biological family of Kamaya Mobley had no idea if she was dead or alive, correct? Uh, correct. And that they had no ability to be a parent or grandparent to their child, correct? In 2014. I'm not saying now, I'm saying then. She was not in their possession. Okay, I'm not talking about a television set that's in someone's possession. How can you be a parent to a child if you don't know if that child's dead or alive and has been kidnapped? Can you explain that? See, that's where I'm getting confused. They did not know where she was, yes, correct. She was still alive, yes, correct. They were her biological, still are her biological, correct. They didn't know where she was, correct. But being that she's still alive, they can still consider themselves parent, grandparent, because she exists. Even if she didn't exist, they can still consider themselves that. At least that's how I'm understanding it. And if that's not how you're asking it, I do apologize. Um, you uh, do a background check on the people that work around kids in the churches, correct? Yes, there is a background check done. And she wouldn't pass that background check now, correct? Most likely now, no. Um, now, you can correct me all wrong, and I'll defer to your expertise, um, but would you not agree that the point of um, your church is through a relationship with God that you're leading a moral and decent life? Correct. And that although Gloria Williams may have been active in your church. Every single minute of every single day, she was grossly violating that moral code, correct? She sinned. She sinned. She committed a sin. In a horrible way, correct? She committed a sin. Okay, well, you would agree that there's degrees of sin. No, sir. Not at all. No, no sir. Degrees. Sin is sin. Okay, so every sin is equal. Every sin is equal. Um, but certainly as a pastor, your um, hope and your job is to help your parishioners uh, overcome sin, correct? We will sin and fall short daily. Everyone is going to make a mistake every day. Sin is sin. The deal is that you repent for your sins and ask for forgiveness. Okay. Um, would not have been a repenting of a sin in this particular case for Gloria Williams who have returned Kamaya Mobley? Repenting of your sin is going to God. Okay, well, I'm talking about for man. For man? Yeah. Okay, that's different. Well, would she have not repented to man if she had brought this child back? If she had brought the child back, that would be relinquishing the child. Repentance is to God. Okay. You don't think God cares how we treat each other? God does care how we treat each other. God, do you think that God would want her to return that child as soon as she could? As soon as she would? As soon as she would. Okay. And if she asked God for forgiveness, God would forgive her. Well, I understand that. But would it not be better for her to return the child immediately? And when she did, if she asked God for forgiveness, God would forgive her. You stated that the person that you know now is not the person that is charged with kidnapping, is that correct? The person that I know now, the person that committed this crime, I did not know her then. <coughs> she was not on my radar then. We weren't in contact then. So I can't speak to that individual. Correct. The individual that I can speak to is the individual that I met who introduced me to a wonderful young lady and let me know that that was her daughter. Okay. That's the person that I met. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So you didn't know the person in 1998. No. But you know the person in 2014. Correct. correct. And the person in 2014 was still daily.
perpetrating a fraud of kidnapping upon this family, correct? Correct. Okay, so the person that you knew was concealing that fact from you. Correct. Okay. Now, you say that, that she's in a terrible situation. You would agree that that ter terrible situation is 100% on her shoulders and her fault, correct? It's her sin, yes. Okay, nobody else's. Correct. Okay. It's not Kamaya Mobley's fault. Of course not. It's not Shinara Mobley's fault. Of course not. Okay, it's her fault. Correct. And any suffering that goes on in her family is her responsibility, correct? We are all going to suffer, regardless of whatever family it is. Okay. So anything that she does or anything that she has done is not only affecting her family, it affects the other family as well, the Mobley family, the Aiken family. It affects every family that is in Walterboro, every family that could be watching this newscast. It's going to affect everybody in some way, shape, or form. So anything that is done does affect anyone. Well, I understand, but my question is that it's her responsibility, nobody else. Then I don't understand your question. Okay. When you sit around and you indicate that you pray a lot um, for Gloria Williams and her family, I assume that you, in the back of your mind, said some prayer for the Mobley and Aiken families as well. Correct? That is not an assumption. I can guarantee you that when I pray in Buckhead United Methodist Church, Hickory Hill, or anywhere, I pray for both sides because both sides have been damaged, both sides hurt, both sides need healing. Both sides need to understand forgiveness, and I pray for everyone. There's no just pray for one person involved. So please, sir, don't do that. Well, I said I assumed it. I believe that to be the case. That is Why true. That's the question. It's because I would assume that you, as a, as a woman of God, that you would recognize the pain and heartache that has gone on with the Mobley and Aiken family, and you would say prayers for their healing. I did, and I do. I would, I would pray. You would do that, so I thank you for that. Would you? Can you even begin to imagine the heartache that they suffered? No, I cannot. Okay. I cannot. But listening to her and being a parent, I can understand and I can, I can empathize because I hear the pain, I hear the hurt, and for that, I pray and I ask God to lighten her pain and lighten her hurt. But for you to stand here and kind of be a little sarcastic about the fact that I prayed for somebody or that what I believe or what I know, sir, I do apologize. But if I don't understand a question, I'm going to tell you I don't understand it. I don't want you to criticize me for being sarcastic. I was just trying to figure out if you understood the damage that was caused in this case. And you've answered that question. Yeah. OK. Um, because I want to make it clear, the victim in this case is not Gloria Williams. I never said she was. Okay. That's what I wanted to clear. And we're on the same page. Reverend. Thank you so much for your time. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, counsel. Any further questions for this witness? Of course. Definitely. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Anything further, Mr. Mizrahi? I think it's a good time for an afternoon break. Thank you so much for your time. It's 3 p.m. Why don't we come back at 3.15, so just under 15 minutes. We're in recess until 3.15.